Hi everyone, my name's Dan Draper and welcome to my YouTube channel. Thank you so much for tuning in. Make sure you hit that like, subscribe and turn on all notifications to keep up to date with the content that I'm going to be putting out, including my podcast. Let's get into the videos. Hi everyone and welcome back to the Dan Draper podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in with me today. I really do appreciate it and today I've got a very special treat for you. I've got someone who I was really lucky to share the pitch with a couple of weeks ago and uh, he definitely put me through my paces. So Mr. Marvin Sordell, would you like to introduce yourself, sir? Yeah, um, well thanks for having me first and foremost. Obviously I know that what you're doing is incredible and, and this convers these types of conversation are so important. So I'm glad to be able to be on here and, and share my thoughts, my story, my perspective on, you know, everything to do with mental health and, and humanity essentially, because that's what it encapsulates really, yeah. Exactly, man. Honestly, thank you so much. So how are you, mate? How are things? Good. Busy as as always, but busy is always good because, you know, particularly during the pandemic where a lot of people are out of work, losing jobs, or or there's so much uncertainty. I'm I'm you know very very fortunate that you know it's been kind to me in in a working sense. So, so yeah, I can't complain. Oh, nice man. And as I said at the top of the show, you know I was lucky enough to share the pitch with you the other day, and uh, <laughs> yeah, we played the charity better game against our good mate Jamie Clements, <laughs> and luckily got the win. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean. Another 10, 15 minutes we might not have done. <laughs> Mate, honestly. Do you know what? Though? I'm claiming it. Goal line save from me. I'm happy with that. In defence, I was on the front post. I'll take it. <laughs> so, wait, all of them matter, don't they? Exactly, man. But um, yeah, I, I must admit, I have been feeling it afterwards. I said to you just before we started recording, my quad went and I'm, I was I was hobbling around for a while. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, mate, honestly, thank you so much. So, mate, what I wanted to do, start off talking about your career because you've had such an incredible career when you, uh, when you were playing. You know, let, just talk to us about that and where you started off. Yeah, I mean, I started off playing like everyone else, playing Sunday League football, playing in the park with mates. And, uh, but, you know, I was probably quite different in the sense that from the age of six, I always said I wanted to be a professional football player. That was all I ever knew. Yeah, you know, my my dream, my goal from as early as I can remember. So everything I did really was centered around football, playing football, or trying to, you know, edge closer to my goal. Really, so you know whether it was kicking a ball with friends in a park, playing Sunday league games, or just out in my own in the garden kicking a ball against a wall and practicing, you know, left foot, right foot, and all those that stuff. That was literally most of my childhood to be fair like as I said I had, I had football was my entire life and it encompassed everything in terms of what I did and who I was yeah, so my complete identity was I play football that's who I am all I want to do is be a football player and you know the early part of my life that's that's all I can remember really <laughs> Mate, and, and, you know, you then came through the academies and, and things like that, and you've played for some amazing teams. Like, we've got Watford, we've got Bolton, we've got Burnley, the international side of it. Talk us through that and how, like, you went from, you know, starting out to those to, to those bigger teams and through the academies, but then also into GB, because that must have been unreal, mate. Yeah, so, I mean, I started off, as I said, playing Tony League. I eventually got scouted for Chelsea when I was 13. I went on trial there. Fortunately, it didn't work out, but, but I learned an incredible amount that enabled me to then go into my next opportunities when I got scouted at Fulham the next year as a 14-year-old and, you know, went in and was flying, got signed there, was there for a couple of years before. I got released and went to Watford and that was really the start of my proper journey into professional football because, you know, I got scholarship there, got pro there, made my debut there and broke into the first team quite young, like 18, 19, when I broke into the first team. And, you know, things were really just moving forward. You know, I had probably like a two, three-year spell. That was probably the best of my career entirely, where I went from, you know, just getting into the team at Watford, scoring my, you know, having my highest goal-scoring year. And then, you know, playing for England at under-20s for the first time, getting called up for the under-21s. then 
getting called, then getting a move to Bolton in the Premier League, and then subsequently getting called up to Team GB for London 2012 as well, which was, which was pretty incredible. You know, it, 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 at the time I didn't really realize, or you know, when you're when you're in it, you don't really feel or notice how big a, a deal it is because you're just kind of focused on that moment, that training session, that those moments within that training session. You know, the next training session, recovery, the next day you know, the match and all that stuff. And you don't really get to enjoy it as much when you're really stuck in it because it's such a whirlwind. Everything moves at such a fast pace. But looking back, you know, it's just such a special, special time because you know, I'm from London, born and raised. You know, I, I grew up in Harrow, which is around the corner from Wembley. I used to go to Wembley yeah. Market as a kid. You know, I'm walking out of Wembley, you know, in the Olympics, the home games. You know, it's, it's incredible. Mad. And was there was there one game in your career or one goal maybe that stuck out in your mind that was just like, yeah, that's decent. I'm happy with that. <laughs> yeah. Um probably the goal I scored for my first goal for England the twenty ones, we played Israel in a friendly and uh like a turn and shot for I can't even know how remember how far out it was like maybe like thirty yards or twenty five, thirty yards or something on my left foot and you know, went in off the post and I ended up getting man and match that game as well. And that was just like a, a huge, huge moment. You know, my mum was there to see it. She, she, funnily enough, she'd been to most, if not all of my professional games at that point, barring like a couple of the most special ones. So she didn't get to see my actual debut in professional football. She didn't actually get to see my first goal in professional football, but she was there for my England under 20 debut when I scored against France and then my England under 21 first game first goal that I scored as well she was there for so you know it was quite special as well yeah and that must be mad like but who who would you say like just off the cuff question who would you say would be the person that you played against that you were like oh like they're really tough to play against uh well before the Olympics we played a friendly against Brazil and mm. they they had a pretty star-studded squad and uh yeah. you know when I came on I came on for about half an hour 20 minutes half an hour or something and you know, directly coming up up against Thiago Silva, you know, that was a, a big challenge, you know, and I was, right. I think I was 21 at the time, and he, you know, he's playing for, I think he's either at AC Milan or PSG, and you're thinking, you're playing against one of the best defenders in the world, Yeah. and you realise why they're one of the best defenders in the world, and, you know, sharing a picture with the likes of, like, Neymar and Lucas Moura and, and Pato and Hulk, and you see these players, and, you're, and I think Marcelo as well, and you think, see these players, and you think, you know, this is why they're at that level and I'm I'm not because they're just <laughs> so incredibly gifted. Do you ever take stock of that as well that you're just like, yeah, I should share the pitch with Neymar. Like you go down the pub or whatever, you're like, oh yeah, Neymar was there, like Tiago yeah. Silva, like. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's hard to really, to think, you know, because you see these guys, even obviously now I watch them in, on TV and stuff and, you know, I'm, I've, I'm fortunate I've managed to play with and against some incredible incredible players you know and, and you know I, I don't take that for granted because you know as a kid I grew up you know looking up to a lot of the players and looking up to players that play for these big clubs and even when I was a professional you know you watch these guys on tv and then sometimes when you're sharing a picture of them it's just like wow you know I've managed to get to this point somehow yeah that's mad, man. And how one thing that I did want to ask you is when you were starting out in your football career and then obviously as it progressed, how did your mental health change in that time? Uh, not in, in the early stages, I not too much. Um, I think the first time they really probably ever flagged up, I guess, was when I became a, a scholar at Watford, going from being a schoolboy, being released at Fulham to then going to Watford. You kind of go from being part-time you know, you're training a couple of nights a week and you're you're almost treated like a kid, whereas you go into scholarship and you're training every day, doing double sessions, you know, and the expectation is completely different. Like overnight, it just changes. And I found, found that really difficult in the first year, you know, the, the physical and mental demands of, and the demand just of being a professional were just a lot for me. And I found that really difficult to, to deal with, particularly emotionally. Um, you know, because there was so much pressure and so much expectation. Yeah, you know, I, I really struggled with that. So that was probably the first period of time where I, I ever experienced something like that. And I never 
really realize that until later down the line when I really actually struggled with depression. Mm-hmm. And that that was probably the first instance where it probably could, was flagged and could have been, you know, tackled at that point. Yeah. And I mean, you know, we're going to come on to, to that in, in a moment, but was there anybody, and I've seen a couple of interviews about this, but was there anybody at that time that was kind of supporting you, not only just in your career, but in, in terms of you as, as Marvin as well? Because I, I saw a couple of interviews talking about how Sean Dyche was actually, you know, a really good coach for you. Um, so obviously not saying anything about Sean, but was it that, you know, when you were going through those times uh, in the clubs and moving up the ranks, that there was the support function in there as well? Yeah, I mean, th- th- a lot of clubs don't really, or didn't at that time, have that support function or, or, you know, in terms of mental health or or the emotional side or psychology. But Watford at the time were one, I guess they were quite ahead of their time. A guy called Keith Mincher was there and I had a lot of conversations with him, like an, an incredible amount of conversations with him, half of which I don't remember. But, you know, we he was there to, to support me and, and question and, and I guess allow me to probably for the first time to look inwardly at what's going on in, inside myself and, and really understand who I am. And that's probably one of the reasons why I struggled a little bit as well because, you know, it, having to look inwardly is, is difficult. It's difficult for a lot of people. And you know, for myself to do that for the first time, you know, it was, it was pretty tough. Mm. And how was it working with Sean as well? Cause I've obviously seen him at Burnley for years and years and he's just been this kind of big kind of ballsy stoic person. Who's just like, nah, we'll just get on with it. Like you, he questions <laughs> things like VAR and stuff like that, which we all do a lot of the time. But, yeah. Um, but yeah, how was he as a character? Like when you're, when you're working with him, yeah, I mean, he's obviously, you know, adapted and and changed over the years. But you know, as, as any coach or any manager does, or any person does, really, you change over the years, and you you adapt to your circumstances. You know, when I first came across him, he was he came into Watford as the like assistant to the under 18s manager. So he wasn't even under, he wasn't the main guy for the under 18s, and you know, he pushed me a lot. You know, tried to really get me out of my comfort zone and push me out of my comfort zone, you know, both as a person and as a football player. And in the second year that, that in the first year, I found that tough to be pushed that much and pushed outside of my comfort zone so much. But in the second year that really thrived and that really helped me to, to move forward. And he went from being the under 18 manager in my second year to the reserve manager the follow, and the following year and assistant manager as well and then when I broke through to the first team he was assistant manager and then in my last year was a first team manager so you know I worked him a lot extensively over that that whole time I was at Watford essentially and then again uh, later down the line when I went to Burnley as well. Yeah and it, as I said like it, he he comes across as such a great guy as well who's real as well because mm. you can get caught up with it all can't you but what were some of your career highlights then I mean we've touched on a couple there with uh, you know things like the the Olympics and playing against Brazil, but is are, are there any sort of standout moments for you that you were like, yeah, actually, this is this is kind of the biggest thing that I'm gonna do in football. Yeah, I mean it was definitely the Olympics for sure. I mean, walking out of Wembley, you know, s- starting a game at Wembley, you know, walking out and standing there lining up, and you know, you look around, there's like ninety thousand people there, and you know, thinking back to the time where, you know, you were at Wembley Market in your Sunday league kit straight from the game, like got mud up your, your legs and stuff and, you know, just getting some lunch or getting food or whatever in the market with my mum. And, you know, Wembley Market was literally in the car park of the old Wembley. Mm. So, you know, I look back at that moment and I had friends and family at the game. And it's just like, wow, this is like it'd be hard to imagine how it gets better than that. You know, yeah. obviously I was fortunate then to to play in the Premier League a few times as well. For me, starting against Arsenal was another big one because, you know, I'm an Arsenal fan, grew up an Arsenal fan and, mm. you know, starting at, at the Emirates against Arsenal was, you know, in the Premier League was, that's huge. Yeah. You know, and there are obviously moments where I scored goals and stuff like that, but just in terms of that, those emotional connections, probably those two. 
Yeah. And I can imagine as well, I mean, now we're slowly getting back to it as well, but the reaction from the crowd, which has been sorely missed in this season and, you know, it's going to be a bit tough during the Euros, but I can imagine as soon as you walk out onto the pitch and you see however many thousands of people, that must have given you such a rush. It does, but it just kind of disappears straight away. Oh, really? It's, it's really strange. Like, the, you know, when you're when you're in that environment as a professional football player, you just, as soon as the game starts, you get almost just sucked into the game and your mind just, your mind of everything that's going on around. It could be the loudest, you know, stadium that you could possibly be in, but it wouldn't make a difference because all you know is, the game is going on, and you're just you're just so focused on the game that you you kind of it kind of blurs out in the background, so you don't really hear the chants and noise, unless there are like real breaks in plays where you can kind of foot zone like kind of like zone out of that of that you know the intensity of the game, or you know there are occasionally when there are corners and free kicks and things like that. You know when there are breaks in play, sometimes you 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 kind of get out of that moment of the game, and you kind of are able to absorb the atmosphere itself but generally generally it's just the game is going on and it, you could be playing in the park because you're just so focused on like what's going on yeah uh, that's mad man I couldn't even <laughs> couldn't even imagine it like but then obviously you come towards the end of your career and as you've said you've been quite open in in talking about it so how did you when you were thinking of retiring and the reasons that you retired can you tell us a bit about that and how your mental health was at that time as well because I know that that played quite a key part in why you come away from football a bit yeah I mean that was the main decision and the main reason I came away from football and decided to to you know, hang my boots up essentially was my mental health was, was, was in a great place. You know, I I battled with that quite severely for, you know, three, four, five, however many years before that. And I under I started to understand mental health and my own mental health a lot more as time went on. And I got to a point where I realized that the, the common denominator for me was the fact that I was a professional football player and you know, I, I I was in a place where I was not I was not in a happy place and mm. that was affecting my relationships, you know, particularly with my daughter at the time and, and then see I had a son on the way as well. And I just thought, you know, why am I doing this if it's not making me happy anymore? This was my dream, but I can't hang on to the fact that it was my dream at some point. You know, I've managed to live my dream. So what what am I hanging on to by staying in something that makes me unhappy you know I'm, I'm away from, you know I've been living away from home and my family and, and my friends for 10 years you know I'm moving home like every and I've moved I'd, at that point I'd moved home like I think it was seven times in six years I'd moved home it's and was like, that due to the football with the moving of yeah, clubs just or? With football moving clubs and stuff so you just end up moving around the country and stuff and you know whether that's sometimes through performance, whether it's good or bad or, or, you know, falling out with managers or wherever it may be, I ended up moving home a lot and moved, you know, was moving to different places in the country each time. So, you know, moving home seven times in six years was it's difficult. You know, it's difficult to maintain relationships. It's difficult to, you know, especially when you're, you're so far away from, you know, where you grew up as well and where your family and friends are. You know, it's just, you get to a point where you think, you know, why... Why am I continuing to do this? You know, and you think, well, yeah, the this is my career path, and you know, financially I'm stable, and I just thought, you know, I can. There are other options for me out there, and you know, I was quite fortunate that I'd already started doing stuff in writing and in media and film as well. So I thought, you know, there, there's an opportunity here for me to to move on, and I don't need to wait for someone to tell me that, you know, your contract's not going to get renewed and go, all right, then I'll just kind of walk away now. You know, I, I was in a position where I just thought, yeah, this is this is the right time. I'm making the right decision. You know, I'm, I'm not going to have any regrets because, you know, I've, I've managed to achieve, achieve an, incred- an incredible amount. And what I achieved, I, I would never have dreamed of when I was a kid. So... It was just a decision I made, and even though it's, it was a difficult decision to walk away, at the same time it was pretty easy. It was pretty, pretty straightforward to make in the sense that I was putting my happiness over everything. 
Yeah, and I think that's the thing. And that's the key thing that you mentioned there as well is about relationships, not only, yeah. um, you know, your relationships, but with the relationships with your family and your friends. And we've seen it throughout the the various lockdowns about being away from people and how it's changed people's mental health. So I can only imagine in such a, in a relatively short period of time and that many moves, moving to different places, things like that, how that can kind of change your mental state. I mean, what would you say would have been, you know, your your lowest point with that? Because I know that I've I've heard on, a couple of different, uh, you know, podcasts and interviews um, that you were thinking at one point that there was a there was a time that you were thinking of taking your own life. Yeah, I mean, I I attempted to, you know, and I'm pretty open about that because I think it's important for me to to share the lowest, like the very lowest, because it gives people a, an understanding and a perspective of where I'm talking from, and also people who are maybe in that place as well, they can understand that, you know, I'm I was there. You know, I, I reached that very, very li- limit that, you know, I think that human beings can, can reach. And, and you know, where I am now in life, where I'm happy and I've kind of worked my way through that, I think it's important to pe- for people to kind of see both, see all of that, not just the fact that I'm in a good place and I kind of went through depression and stuff like that. It's like, no, I went to the, those extreme depths where you feel like life is pointless, worthless and and you just have a con- constant numbness to where I am now, where you know I, I enjoy life, and, and you know humanity is so amazing, and and I really value it to the the utmost degree. So I think it's it's important I share that because you know it, it may it may help someone to to see that it's possible to find a way through. Yeah, exactly. And again, thank you for being so open, honest with that, you know, because I think, like you said, it's so important um, because, you know, realistically as guys, and I've said this a couple of times, we're not great at talking about mental health a lot of the time, especially people that I I know from back home that are footballers and the, the football guys that from back home wouldn't say boo to a goose about it, but my rugby no. mates kind of would open up a little bit about it. So I think the fact that, you know, we're having conversations like this and, well, you're a footballer. I mean, I got on for a little cameo for about 20 minutes, <laughs> but um, <laughs> but that we can have these conversations. You know, this is this is where it's all about. This is the the release and the stigma, and hopefully, that the people who may have been a bit more, I don't, I wouldn't want to say ignorant, but not just educated about mental health in the football space, have now kind of come to these decisions and come to this. Uh, you know, how they can open up and talk about it, because essentially, this is part of the reason why I started the podcast. There's certain members of my football mates actually started to talk about mental health and, you know, caring rather than how many goals Jamie Vardy's banged in or, you know, what's going on with the transfer markets and things like that. So I think it's a slow process and, uh, but we're, we're kind of getting there now. And one thing that I wanted to ask you as well is how you kind of changed it because uh, I turned and turned it around because for me, you know, the, what you've built out of your experiences and obviously working with Beda being one of the ambassadors um, and things like that. Just tell us how you kind of turn it around and, and what it is that you're you're kind of doing to release the stigma now. Well, to turn it around, it's, 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 it was a long, long old journey, you know, even from that point of being at my very lowest. It, it was, a, I was still there for a long time, you know, after that. And as I said earlier, you know, just a lot of deep reflection on who I am, who I wanted to be. Um, really understanding what life meant to me, what my friendships and relationships and stuff meant to me as well, and and kind of just rebuilding from that point, as well as you know su- getting support from family, from friends, from therapists and psychologists, doctors, etc. You know, because I think that's important as well. You know, you can't expect to do it all on your own. You can't expect to do it all overnight. You know, me sharing my thoughts and my feelings and my emotions with the people closest to me allowed them to understand what was going on which allowed them to I guess treat me with with that understanding you know they they wouldn't be maybe as misunderstanding of where our relationship was at you know for example with friends they may wonder why I'm not reaching out to them as much and kind of blaming me or or whatever and they're they're more understanding more more open to what's going on and I think things like that are important because you can't just expect people to understand what's going on if you don't give them some sort of insight. So that definitely helped. And, you know, through time, through conversations, speaking more and more about it and 
even publicly and people being receptive to it really helped. You know, I think without that as well, I probably wouldn't be continuing to do what I do now, you know, have mm. these conversations on podcasts, interviews, TV, whatever. And I wouldn't yeah. do so because if I was being attacked for it, why would I continue to do it? Whereas, you know, it's, it's clear that it helps a lot of people because I get so many messages and people reaching out to me for help and for advice, et cetera, and, or just for an ear, really. So it's, it's definitely important that these conversations continue to happen because every single person goes through some sort of, you know, mental health, not crisis, but, you know, goes through a patch of poor mental health. You know, yeah. same way that, you know, your your physical health, and I say it all the time, your physical health and your mental health are, are exactly the same. You know, they fluctuate mm. from good to bad, depending on what you, what's going on in your life. You know, we know that with physical health and we know that if we eat poor and don't exercise and don't do this or don't do that, you know, that's going to affect your physical health. And eventually you'll get to a point where if you don't address that, it's going to it's going to really affect you on a on a very deep level. And it's the same with your mental health. You know, if we don't do things that make us happy, if we don't share how we feel and our emotions and address those, then it's going to really eat away and, and affect us on a deep level. So it's just more so speaking about it in that sense and more so getting people to understand that. Yeah. And I think one of the key points that you've said there, and I've I've mentioned this a few times, is mental health and exercise go hand in hand. I know for me that I in the beginning of this year with things like tier four and the constant lockdowns and stuff, my mental health went quite downhill, um, especially on the lead up to, to series two. And it just meant that I just stopped all the workouts, didn't even bother go for runs. And I just ate crap and it was awful. And now I'm kind of coming out the other side of it, you know, st- still having these conversations for the podcast, but working on my own mental health. Cause I think that was the problem for me is that I was just constantly putting layers and layers and layers of pressure on myself to do that and it was just all of that pressure that was the admin side of things or general life admin and stuff like that you then take away time for yourself and for your exercise for your mental health and your physical health so I'm learning that now I'm definitely learning a lot more to take a lot more you know time and care of myself especially now that things are starting to open up again and then you know not rushing into things as well because I think that's the major thing is that a lot of people now a feeling like oh the pubs are open so we all need to get there and you know that kind of thing it's just taking that time because we you know we've been locked up for over a year almost now and reintroducing yeah. ourselves into society and for me I've now on the back of our game uh, from better I'm now starting a five aside team and an 11 aside team that I'm then going to put towards uh, better as a as a game but it's that sense yeah. of bringing people together as well but in the in the other you know grand scheme of things it's you know building the connections and working on your physical health as well for me which I'm really looking forward to yeah no I, I completely agree and it's and it's so important it's so important that that you know people recognize that but I think just the more we have this conversation the more it kind of hammers home that message really and gets people to to really see the value in it yeah Absolutely. So, mate, there's one thing that I wanted to approach with you as well, which is talking about racism and racism within the game. And I spoke to Wade Small about this in series one um, around how his experiences were when he was playing in the championship um, and for Wimbledon and play uh, and people like that. What do you what's your views in terms of racism within the game and how can we continue to stamp it out because I mean, even just as recently, I read something that Rio Ferdinand put out when Manu was playing Wolves right. and he was having racist chants towards him. And you kind of think after everything that's gone on in the past year, not only with the pandemic, but with, you know, bringing conversations to the forefront around George Floyd, around Black Lives Matter and, you know, the countless campaigning that goes on with it, that people would be more awake and alert to, you know, those types of the way that they talk about things so yeah just tell us about that yeah I mean I think the biggest thing and the probably the the biggest issue is that people don't recognize the emotional and traumatic impact that racism has on on anyone that that suffers from it you know I think that's probably the number one thing is that you know people see it as almost words and they're just like bad words or whatever and 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 so it's not that bad, but like, you know, it, it's these things are so deep rooted 
And so they have so much power, weight, and history behind them that it's mo- they are more than just words. They are they are extremely effective, and they can cause serious trauma for for a lot of people because they are it, without a shadow of a doubt like dehumanizing to you know a level that is it kind of it's, it's difficult to even describe in words so mm. for the biggest thing is really trying to get people to understand like how how much that how deeply that cuts and how how much that affects people because without that it's difficult to get people to really to understand like the the real impact of what those words mean and why racism is such a a big issue and a big problem within society within so many different sectors of society as well because mm-hmm. you know we without that it's just you know people just saying well they're just words you know without really deeply going into it and really getting to grips and when understanding like what those words bring with them then we're probably not going to get anywhere in all honesty yeah and it's it's so tough as well because for me as soon as i uh, you know heard about george floyd's murder last year mm. and then spoke to wade about it and and stuff like that i went on a real spree to educate myself around black culture around black history i was watching loads of documentaries listening to mm. podcasts like rennie Ada lodges and things like that and it was just something that I felt like I really needed to do because for me, I grew up in a town really that was predominantly white. Like in my school, I would have had one, I would have had two people of color, which was one person who came from an Asian background and one that came from a Jamaican background. And the person who came from the Jamaican background was one of my best friends. So for me, I kind of, I saw, um, in my class, I didn't see a lot of inter- interaction with people of color. But when, as soon as I moved to London, I was like, wow, this is this is different because I moved to, to Tooting yeah. in southwest London, which for me, you kind of take in everything that you've ever known and you go into an area that is really dominated by so many different cultures. And it was fantastic because it really, as I said, woke me up to a lot of different things. And with everything that I was learning about all of this, I was like, right, what what can I do? What can I do to to support the causes and and to have voices heard more often and and things like that? And it really it really shocked me how much I didn't know about you know black culture, black history. But I'd grown up with you know, and Vic Hope says this, um, you know, you have the rhythm, but you have to take the blues with it as well. And I grew up with the music in yeah. black culture. Like Motown is is my jams. Like I love Motown music. I love soul yeah. music, things like that. But I never really understood until I got older the stories and the pain that was behind it. So that for me was the transitional moment where yeah. I was like, yeah, I really need to, to educate myself. But what would you say people can do to educate themselves? Because again, I don't think a lot of people understand and quite rightly, as you said, the weight of some of the words that can be said around racism. That's that's a really good point. And, you know, I think, you know, educating yourself really boils down to stepping outside your comfort zone. You know, I think without doing so, you're not really going to be able to get to understand, like, the, the depths of it, really. You know, whether mm. it's listening to people speak, you know, about their traumatic experiences or you know really looking and understanding the the impact and of like you know structural and societal racism and you know overt racism and I mean they're, they're, we have so many different words and phrases for all these different types so it's just it's just racism in the end of the day and I think really getting to grips with where it has stemmed from you know the the history of not just black culture but also the history of this country and the history of you know western society and and that's the impact that western society has had when it comes to racism really and and how structures have been built and put in place so that you know certain demographics can thrive and others cannot you know and i think it's really just really stepping outside that comfort zone and almost just forcing yourself to be aware of that. I think it's, it's easy for us 
you know, and, and you know, it's, it's the easy choice to just go, you know, what it's it's not really my problem. You know, I don't I don't have to think about it. And you know, I think it takes people who are, you know, seeing things from other people's perspective and and or it's affecting them directly, not just not just it's it's a problem for over there. It's the, it's affecting their it's affecting their people, their circle. You know, you're saying you're one of your best friends, and you know, people will have best friends, partners family members now you know the society is is so multicultural and, and you know cultures are you know so many families and from different demographics and different cultures are are you know having children and having families that it isn't just a problem now just for black people you know maybe as it was you know 40 50 years ago whatever you know now it's a problem that affects so many more people because we are such a multicultural society and there is so much empathy because people are so close to it, even if they're not affected by it directly, they're so close to it, they are being affected by it. So it is on it's on all of us really to to walk that walk, you know, whether it's uncomfortable or not. Sometimes we have to have conversations that we don't want to have. Sometimes mm-hmm. we have to look at things and listen to things that we don't want to particularly listen to, but it's important, you know, if we don't learn history and understand history then we'll just end up re- repeating the same mistakes time and time again you know you look at the oh, holocaust and you look at the holocaust for example and the how how much information there is and how much people understand and know about the holocaust and and, and how traumatic and how bad that was mm. we all understand and we all know and that's important for us to know because then that we won't allow that to happen in the future. We we'll, we'll see how it's happening and, and we'll see it coming if, if anybody ever tried to, you know, try to go down that path again. So I think it's important that we understand as a as a society where we've come from and to understand like we, we don't really want to go back there because it's not good there. Yeah, exactly. And I think for me, like you said there, the uncomfortable conversations, I mean I'm sweating talking about it as a white guy talking to you about it. Like I'm sweating. I did the same with Wade, but yeah. it is that education piece. Do you know what I mean? Like, and I remember I watched um, a little while ago, Leanne Pinnock's um, yeah. documentary that came out. That was brilliant. I remember when um, everything kicked off last year with Black Lives Matter, there was a guy, an American, ex-American football player called Emmanuel Acho. And he does a series called um, Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man. And uh. he's educating white people around racism and sort of things like that. Not from not from a, a point of view like it's it's kind of, oh, you you need to know this. It's kind of like, well, you ask me the questions. And uh. I think that's the biggest thing. It's, it's not asking the questions and not having those uncomfortable conversations that, like you said, will just ultimately just keep this cycle going and we need to break it like we need to break the stigma of mental health we need to break the stigma and all of everything that comes with racism as well so thank you for talking about that man I really appreciate that no I think it's again I think it's so important that we do so because if we don't we can't move forward yeah exactly so tell us about what it is that you're up to now then mate because you've got 180 Productions, which looks fantastic. And I've seen some of the work that you've been doing around that. So tell us a bit more about that and the stuff that you're doing now um, and in the future. Yeah, I mean, I do a lot of things. I mean, 180 Productions is one business that I own. Um, I co-founded an an influencer marketing agency called Soup Social, which we just recently launched. So that's picking up pretty quickly as well. Um, But 180 is my baby, essentially. You know, I co-founded that with two friends and making film and telling stories is something that I've, I'm just in love with, really. It's something that I'm so passionate about and telling stories that that matter, that have a purpose, that can impact change, impact society, impact the way people think, provoke different, you know, thoughts and perspectives is, that's, that's something that we're so keen to do on, on a on mass essentially really you know whether they're short form whether they're documentary scripted you know feature series whatever it may be it's just everything boils down to telling stories because you you get you know film is my favorite medium of storytelling because you you it's almost like getting a painting uh, a song um a 
book, a poem, and human beings, and you know body language, and you put that all into one thing, and that's what filming in, in encapsulates for me. And you get so many different layers of telling a story, and you get to really push the boat in in doing so in so many different ways yeah and some of the things that you were you were putting out I know that you you're doing again a lot of work around the football side of it for the mental yeah. health bit but I remember seeing one of the first trailers I was like oh this is gonna bang <laughs> this is gonna bang <laughs> <laughs> thanks no worries man so the last question mate um yeah. one thing that I wanted to ask you is if someone's struggling at the moment with their mental health or you know they're, they're in the game and they feel like they can't open up and they can't talk what would you say to someone who firstly is struggling with their mental health but any potential advice also for anyone who's starting out in football and wanting to go pro what you can say around any maybe I don't know maybe some support functions or anything like that yeah I mean in terms of you know support and, and if you're struggling with mental health it's always same as everybody else probably would say is reach out to someone, you know, and that doesn't necessarily have to be through having a conversation on the phone or telling them face to face because it's hard. You know, I found it hard and how I did it was I wrote it down and sent it to my friends and family and said how I, you know, in po- in the form of poetry, shared it with them and straight away they could understand how I felt and that broke the ice and we could have conversations off the back of that. You know, it may be that, maybe a text, you know, maybe a friend, maybe a family, maybe just a colleague, someone who can just sit there and listen. You know, it, it's just important to get it off your chest and take that weight off your shoulders. You know, in whatever way that you can, really. Um, in terms of advice for a young football player, you know, it's just the only advice I can give really is to just enjoy it, enjoy every moment, enjoy what you're doing. You know, practice your craft. You know, in get better all the time, learn and listen, you know, watch to, to improve. But more than anything, you just need to enjoy it because it's, it's firstly, it's such a short career, but it's also one that's just so, un, it's just not guaranteed. You know, every game could be your last game. Yeah. So you just have to enjoy it for what it is. And, it's, you know, it can be a, a special career if you, if you, if you take it like that. Yeah, absolutely. Marv, thank you so much for coming on, mate. I really appreciate it. Where is it that we can find you? Where is it we can find all the stuff about 180 (laughs) and yourself and all the stuff that you're uh, getting up to at the minute? Um, Probably social media. It's just every, uh, I mean, my social media, I use Instagram and Twitter and LinkedIn as well. But I've got Facebook, but I don't actually use it. I don't even know how to use it, to be honest. But everything is just um, my name. So just Marvin Shordell perfect bro thank you so much and uh yeah i'm looking forward to the next game i'm getting my team together now so i'm i'm putting it together and hopefully i'll do more than a a 20 minute cameo with a a (laughs) quad pole (laughs) yeah cheers no thanks brilliant thank you mate cheers cheers thank you so much for watching this video make sure you hit that like subscribe and turn on all notifications and i'll see you in the next video